views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. And hello and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Jaime, and today we'll update you on what's happening in and around our community, as well as around the world. Coming up on today's show, we'll take a look at the results of yesterday's primary elections and what it means for the future of New York City. Plus, the local theater is giving providing teens a special performance and an opportunity. We'll find out exactly how you can take part. Plus, we'll also sit down with an organization that is serving as a voice for women to create change. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Because right now, we're officially open. And hello everyone, I'm your host Darren Jaime. Today is Wednesday, September 11th, 2013. Of course, you're watching Open, the only live and interactive program bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV set. We want to encourage you to stay connected to us. You can find out about us at Twitter at BronxNet TV and Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. Well, today marks the 12th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. Today, we remember and reflect on the lives lost during the tragic events of 9-11. And also we move on to other news across our city, They're talking about the primaries and the results. I want to take a look at the primary results that took place yesterday as there were races all across the city and the winners finally declared. Taking a look at the race for mayor, Democrat Bill de Blasio wins, garnering over 40% of the vote uh, with Bill Thompson coming in second place. On the Republican side, Joseph Loda uh, coming away victorious. In the public advocate, the race there, there will be a runoff between Latita James and Daniel Squadron. In the race for Comptroller, Scott Stringer. Bronx Borough President, Democrat Ruben Diaz Jr. comes away with another term being the incumbent. 11th City Council District, Democrat Andrew Cohen and Republican Patricia Brink. In the 12th City Council District, Democrat Andy King and Republican Robert Diamond emerge victorious. Over in the 13th District, Democrat James Vaca and Republican William Britt will face off in the November election. And then in the 14th uh, City Council District, Democrat Fernando Cabrera and also uh, Republican Denise Butler will also go head to head. In the 15th City Council District, it was Democrat Richie Torres edging out a victory and on the Republican side, Joel Rivera. And in the 16th City Council District, Democrat Vanessa Gibson, former Assemblywoman, won the Democrat seat and also on the Republican side, Benjamin Eggleston. Look at the 17th now, Democratic Marie uh, Carmen Arroyo and on the Republican side, Jose Colon uh, emerged victorious. In the 86th Assembly District now, moving to the Assembly, uh, Melanie Johnson and uh, Elizabeth Ortiz, Kenny Nunez, Victor Pichardo, Hector Ramirez, Haley Rivera, and Udelka Tapia. And there you see the 8th City Council District, uh, Democrat Melissa Mark Viverito uh, defeating a string of candidates on the Republican side, Relina Cardona. And uh, there you can get the election results of those of some of the races that took place across New York City, of course. For more complete races, stay tuned to BronxNet and an in-depth analysis. And uh, we'll break some of those races down and what it actually means for the city. So those are the results. We do have to twig, uh, should say take a quick break, but we'll come right back right after this. I love being in classrooms like this one and learning new things. I'm a Brooklyn girl, and I know school can be hard. It's demanding, and we kids have many distractions, 
lots of other things we could be doing. Sometimes even your friends may tell you that school isn't cool, that it isn't the place to be. Don't listen to them. There's nothing more important than education. It's the key to everything else. It helps us understand our world and be better people, better friends, and better citizens. So stay in school. And don't let anyone tell you that you're not good enough or smart enough. Be a star. Shine brighter than anyone else. And you'll make the grade. This has been a public service announcement of the Make the Grade Foundation. Go to makethegrade.org to learn more. Look at me. Hey. Raymond, look at Mommy. Maybe the light hurts his eyes. Maybe she's just not hungry. Maybe he can't hear us. Maybe we're not stimulating him enough. Maybe it's a phase. Avoiding eye contact is one early sign of autism. Learn the others today. The sooner it's diagnosed, the better. NFC, AFC, offensive linemen, defensive tackles, quarterbacks, and cornerbacks are all living united to ensure the academic success of millions of kids in our communities all the way to graduation day. But that won't happen without you. So take the pledge at unitedway.org. Make a difference in the life of a child. Suit up like your favorite NFL players and become a volunteer reader, tutor, or mentor with United Way. And welcome back to Open. The New York Women's Foundation is a cross-cultural alliance working to force change and mobilize women to become leaders. We're pleased to be joined today by Anna Olivieri, who is Oliviera, I uh, should say President and CEO of NYWF, and Angie Kamath, Executive Director of Proscolas, to share more about their work in the Bronx and the economic development, and welcome both to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. It's got to be a little exciting. It's very exciting. It's very exciting, first of all, to be here. Thank you. And be part of a, a network that, like the foundation, is committed to community uh, news, empowerment, and civic engagement. Well, give us Thank a little bit about the foundation. So the foundation is really your, a community foundation. Mm -hmm. Think of uh, New Yorkers that are concerned about New Yorkers and that we invest in the economic security of communities and individuals with an eye on investing in women because philanthropically speaking, women have been left behind. Mm -hmm. We have less than 10% of all philanthropic investments being targeted to women. And women are like, you know that, you have a mother, a sister, a partner, a, a relative, a neighbor. We occupy pivotal roles and many times we're not perceived as economic engines. But the foundation knows, and it's well known now, that investing in girls, investing in women, also brings up boys and men and neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So we've been around for 26 years. We are a fundraising foundation and invest in incredible partners, such as Proscolas. We have a great investment in the Bronx. Uh, the Bronx has uh, vital uh, communities and uh, doesn't have corresponding commitment, mm -hmm. neither from government or from philanthropy to its needs. So it's an honor for us to be able to partner in the Bronx and to be able to be part of uh, highlighting community leaders mm -hmm. that otherwise would not be perceived as positive agents for change that are really experts in making a difference. Angie, give me a little bit about Perscolas and the role that it plays. Sure. So Perscolas is a nonprofit organization. We have been around for nearly 20 years mm -hmm. and our mission is really simple. <coughs> we look to aim uh, we aim to break cycles of poverty by training men and women in IT skills to get them into good jobs. And good jobs for us means jobs that start at $15 an hour and really the sky's the limit in terms of a career in the IT sector. Well, give us a little bit about this here because on September 19th, let's be correct, 2013, at 6 to 9, very special event that's taking place. What is it? So the foundation is very close to the ground. We believe that the same places that have issues and challenges have their solutions. Mm -hmm. So we're coming to the Bronx because the Bronx is a conglomerate of very resilient communities in a very big community. So it's a neighborhood dinner. Mm -hmm. We will gather from six to nine in the Bronx Municipal Building and we're gonna honor uh, women who are making a difference here. Some of them are grantee partners and some of them are other activists and other problem solvers. So we want to invite you and invite anyone to come. The foundation is a very accessible um, organization so people can 
come and support the work, people can come and volunteer and participate. It's a good way to find out and to come together to see who's making a difference that usually doesn't uh, get enough um, you know, acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. When we talk about living here in the borough of the mm -hmm. Bronx, so there's some disparities between those Huge. persons that live in the borough of the Bronx as opposed to some of the other yes. boroughs because first of all, we know here in the boroughs like we deal with unemployment as yes. a major as a yes. major issue yes. and we've always lagged beyond New York City. Yes. Uh, the rest of New York City, I should yes. say. Give us a little bit about the disparities, if you will. So, you know, uh, uh, we just recently put out a report in that rates the various community districts throughout all the boroughs. Mm -hmm. And four of the poorest community districts are located in the borough of the Bronx. Um, the Bronx carries an enormous burden around unemployment and families that are making do without enough economic situations, so they are below the poverty rate. The ability to access education to graduate from high school is lower. To get, you know, to college, such as places like Lehman, is not sufficiently, you know, commensurate. So mm. it, uh, the Bronx is, is an underinvested borough. I think it's changing. I think that. Um, th there are positive changes happening. What we want to assure is that the current residents in the Bronx are able to benefit from those changes. Mm -hmm. And this is why we fund programs that are working with Bronx residents, with women, such as per scholars, you know, giving them the opportunity to become better equipped to support their families, to have their kids go to school, finish school, uh, design a life for themselves. So mm. the Bronx, uh, you know, it's in that tipping point. It needs to be, and we want to call, invite other philanthropists right. to invest in the Bronx too. There so are incredible how, solutions. How, give us a little more on the women and the men and women who are <laughs> part of Poor Scholars. W give us a little bit about their interaction and how things have benefited for them uh, being a part of your organization. Absolutely. So we do serve men and women, but I wanted to really highlight the programs that we um, <coughs> offer to serve women because mm -hmm. I think a big piece of what we do at Perscolis is to really try to break those myths and those stereotypes that IT careers aren't made for women. Right. And so in the past two years of the generous support of the New York Women's Foundation, we have um, trained and gotten into jobs over 157 women. And so when you think about these women, a third of them are coming to us unemployed. 25% of them are coming to us on public assistance. Only half of them have um, are coming to us uh, with just a high school degree. And so they're coming to us where, you know, their earnings in the year prior to coming to Scholars, maybe five, six thousand dollars. They leave their first job with us is about fifteen dollars an hour, between fourteen and fifteen dollars. And the average wage increase, about forty percent of our folks get a wage increase within a year, mm -hmm. is fifteen dollars. <laughs> so you're going from being unemployed or being on public assistance to earning your twenty or thirty dollars per hour. It's a real life changer for a Absolutely. family, as Anna yes. was saying. It's not just the individual who's getting the job. That's it's right his or her children, their neighbors, their community. Right. And so um, what's important about our, our program is it's free, it's full time. And really when I, uh, we just started actually this Monday, a class of 21 women um, mm -hmm. all in a class together where they are fully supported in three and a half months to get the technical skills to get a job, but also they have really important supports. And so they have um, access to corporate volunteers. They have access to um, interview help and resume prep. We take them on site visits to, to workplaces. We really try to work with them and it's not just for the three and a half months that they're with us in the technical full-time training for two years we are committed to these women to help them make sure they succeed in that job make sure they can get additional skills so that they can upgrade themselves and get one of those fantastic wage increases what are some of the challenges the greatest mm -hmm. challenges that women face walking in the door with mm -hmm. you if there's anything um, that I wanted to really communicate today, it's that IT is an amazing career for women. Mm -hmm. We are finding our employers from the kind of corporate employers, Bloomberg's, Barclays, New York Stock Exchange, to nonprofits, to um, other types of small and medium businesses. Um, our employers, quite frankly, are clamoring to hire our women graduates. And so I think we really need to break the stereotypes about what an IT career can look like. Um, what's also important in terms of the challenges is just making sure, um, sometimes it's just the basics that we hear from employers. So making sure that you're sticking with it, that you're taking that first job, maybe um, a first job at $14 an hour 
isn't quite where you want it to be. It's not where your aspirations are. They're much higher, but take that job, stick with it for six months, get additional skills, and you will advance mm -hmm. in that career. Mm -hmm. The beauty of IT is it's, um, I think, in my opinion, it's one of the last sectors where you can have someone with a non-traditional background, someone who maybe didn't mm -hmm. go to college, mm -hmm. really excel, and it's really just about self-educating yourself and continuing to aspire and reach for more skills. Definitely a career there, definitely a career there. And you know, it's so important. So for scholars, for instance, works with a network of other providers. Some of, uh, some of them who we support, some of them other organizations that can address some of the challenges that you're referring to there, which is childcare issues, histories of uh, violence that have been unaddressed or trauma. Uh, the the self-image that Angie's talking about, that women don't conceive themselves as being able to succeed mm -hmm. in IT. So support for the kids, you know, all the support that they need, um, as we, we play sometimes some hub roles in families, right? So sometimes the ability for somebody to show up to training all the time, to stick with that job means that the other supports need to be there. So for the foundation, it's really important that communities as a whole become resilient. So we fund Perscolas, we fund other training programs, we fund programs that work with health, programs that work with teens, after school programs, because that woman in that training needs to have access to other supports. So she can rise up and so can others with her. Before we leave, let's give people more information. Once again, I want to tell you, September 19th is the place to be. Uh, come on down to the Bronx Municipal Building off the Rotunda uh, from 6 to 9, and there you can take part in the neighborhood dinner in the Bronx. Uh, and there you see the event right there on your screen. Now, for people who want more information before we leave, let's get them how we get information for both Prescolas and uh, moving forward. Sure. So the best way to connect with Prescolas is really to go to our website, <laughs> www.perscolas.org, P E R. S C H O L A S dot org. Um, every day of the week, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m., we have an information session where folks can drop in, show up, and really learn about the program, and then from there apply and, and hopefully get started. And our programs are free. Okay. So the foundation, of course, we welcome anyone. We need you. The foundation is as good as the people that make it be, as the New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. So www.nywf.org. Mm -hmm. And we can also connect you with Angie. We can also connect you for scholars and other needs that might be there. All right. Well, thank you both thank for you coming so and sharing you, with us here on the so show. Much. And best wishes <laughs> on the 19th. Thank you, Darren. All righty. Well, guess what? We have to take a quick break. But when we return, we're going to find out more about yesterday's election results. We'll break that down as well as the future of New York City. Stay tuned. We'll be right back right after this. All right. Give me a spot. You know my motto, safety first. They could be dangerous. I think we should call animal control. Animal control? To be safe. Don't worry. Just... I got this. It's a new motto. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. Read to a child today and spark a lifetime of ambition. You wouldn't let money just blow out of your house. So when your AC or heater is on, make sure the doors, windows, and fireplace flue are shut tight. If you're headed out, turn down the AC or lower the heat by 10 degrees. And always keep your water heater set at 120. A little bit of common sense goes a long way. Get more great tips at energysaver.gov. Barry, time is running out. According to my calculations, one in five kids in America struggles with hunger. How can so many children face hunger when there's more than enough food to feed them all? You're right, Barry. We can help solve hunger by teaming up with Feeding America to get food to hungry kids in communities across the country. Help Flint and the Feeding America Network of Food Banks get food to the people who need it in your community. Find your local Feeding America food bank at feedingamerica.org slash hunger. Together, we're Feeding America.
and welcome back to Open Jerry Jaime here with you. Well, with the New York City primary election results in and the general election on its way, we're now pleased to be joined by Democratic strategist Roy Paul as well as Republican strategist Brandon Bryce here in studio to talk today and discuss the next potential leaders of the city and how they'll address some important topics such as housing, education, economy, environment. And uh, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank and, you. Uh, long night for all of us. And uh, as you look back, <laughs> What are your thoughts? I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. as I was saying to my last, it's certainly not a dull night last night. Uh, I think many people were surprised as well as on their toes. It was a very interesting night. I actually uh, uh, was one of the co-hosts with RNN last night uh, following the primaries. And one of the interesting things I think we saw is that, uh, you know, de Blasio, many people thought he was going to make the 40 percent and actually be the Democratic nominee. But out of nowhere, Bill Thompson all of a sudden decided to get some life. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now he, it's looking like it appears to be a possible runoff, which I think is de Blasio's worst nightmare. I think on the Republican side, uh, Joe Loda clearly was the primary candidate. And I think that right now, if Joe Loda, uh, if you're Joe Loda, you're thinking, I need a minority economic plan immediately following last night's primaries. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I agree. Uh, Bill Thompson, for the first time, I think, showed that he can actually be the Democratic <laughs> nominee. Uh, I was so happy that there is now going to be a runoff because I placed a very substantial financial bet on the <laughs> fact that there would be a runoff, and now I will be receiving money instead of having to give it away, which is not something that happens very often. It wasn't a large amount. Um, I can pay my rent. Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is increasing every single year. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the way that it's going to shape out here is the Blasio certainly has the upper hand. I think Bill Thompson um, doesn't cater to the liberalist of the citizens in New York City. And when you look at New York City, especially on the Democratic side, this is not like Orange County, New York mm. Democratic Party. I mean, the, the Democrats here are strict liberals. Uh, you know, they love the fact that Bill de Blasio uh, has this interracial look with his family. They love the fact that um, he is probably one of the most progressive mayors we will ever have in New York City. When you look at his issues on stop and frisk, he has been unwavering on that. Bill Thompson wavered, uh, and he mm -hmm. admittedly wavered on that when it comes to uh, education policies. I mean, we can go down the list. I think this is the year for Democrats, and it's the year for liberal Democrats. I actually agree. I, you know, unfortunately, I think that, uh, you know, after 20 years of, uh, you know, Republicans occupying City Hall, I think Joe Loda has a very serious challenge ahead of him. Uh, I just think people, I think the, the third term of Bloomberg really kind of almost guaranteed a Democratic primary. The question is, I actually have to disagree with my counterpart, is I'm not sure that New York is a totally liberal city. I think New York mm -hmm. is more of a maybe a center left uh, city. And I think that's where folks are looking. I mean, let's look at it. I mean, Bill de Blasio has the, the, the police union, the fire unions behind him. Uh, he's considered a man who business is actually not afraid of. And I think that's very dangerous for a primary. But then you say you have all these things behind you and still end up having a runoff. Well, uh, you know, it, you, you were looking at the fact that de Blasio right now, uh, you know, even his even his ex his victory speech. I mean, it was bland. You know, there was let, there's there was not a lot of excitement, whereas uh, Bill Thompson, you know, the three weeks, the three more weeks chatter actually got people pumped up. And so I think it's going to be a very interesting three weeks. And I think, like I said, uh, if you're Loda, uh, you're looking at really creating an economic message that actually puts people back to work and puts New Yorkers back to work, specifically in the outer boroughs. If you're Bill, if you're uh, Bill Thompson, you're looking at how do we paint the picture uh, that De Blasio just is not is not qualified for the job. And can that picture actually be painted by a Bill Thompson? No, because they're all qualified, to, to be honest with you. The, the question is not who's, more quali uh, who's not qualified, who is qualified. The question is who is more qualified than the other. And I think when it comes down to the voting electorate, they're looking at different things. If you look at the Bronx, if you look at Queens or Staten Island, the issues are different. And union endorsements are not mm -hmm. monolithic. Just because I'm a member of the police union doesn't mean I'm going to vote for Bill de Blasio because they endorse them. So I think people have to stop thinking that just because you get an endorsement that everyone in the union is going to vote for you. I was uh, with people uh, who was uh, members of the FBI. Uh, F, uh, UFT going into voting uh, at PS 163, which is one of the highest voting uh, polling stations in New York City, and they were voting for Bill de Blasio, but their union endorsed Bill Thompson. So it doesn't mean, you know, just because their union endorsed him that they'll get that support. But I think it, t it, it, what it, it paints a picture in, in terms of leadership. Let's forget, New York City's mayor, it's an executive position. Uh, we've got the fourth largest budget in the world, and so I think it's very important 
that when we're talking about who's going to be the next mayor, if it's looking like it's going to be a Democrat, that we pick the most qualified candidate in this race. And I think between de Blasio, who, I mean, let's be let's be quite frank, the New York City public advocate, it's an ombudsman position. It's not an executive position. It's an ex officio city council position. So, I mean, Bill de Blasio, I mean, Bill Thompson has actually been a city, a city comptroller and understands how to budget a 40 billion dollar budget. That's important when we're deciding who our next mayor is going to be. But what is the message that both candidates are going to need to send over these next few weeks? Because obviously uh, you retool, you reshape mm -hmm. and you come out. What's the message that needs to be sent? Let's start off if you're Bill de Blasio. I think if you're Bill de Blasio, uh, if I'm advising Bill de Blasio, I'm telling him, Bill, you got to wake up. Uh, starting <laughs> today, it's a whole new race. And we've got three more weeks to decide who's going to be the uh, Democratic primary. And I think he's got to go. He's got to hit the message harder, specifically towards uh, the everyday, work, everyday hardworking New Yorker. If you're Bill Thompson, whatever you did last night, keep doing it for the next three weeks. Well, the problem with that, however, is that Bill Thompson only started doing that last <laughs> night. But uh, look, look, whatever message any of these people have to convey, they have to convey first and foremost that they can actually relate to average voters. Uh, and the problem here is that Joe Loda last night, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I was in a room with people who said, who's Joe Loda? He's now the Republican nominee for mayor of New York City, and people didn't even know who he was. Uh, and that's his problem. Uh, but then there's also a, a, a ability that he has to convey when he's speaking to people. And there was something that wasn't really connecting uh, with, his, with the visual within his face. Um, I, I don't know if there was a lisp there. Mm -hmm. There was something I was picking up that just wasn't really translating very well. But, um, and I'm not knocking a disability if he has one, but I, I just didn't see the, well, the personality coming through but, but you know, uh, on the camera. The, the but wait a second, hold on. Uh, but Bill de Blasio, I, I think his message has been clear for the entire time. You know, this tale of two cities, you have the have and the have nots. He has been consistent on his message to tax, uh, tax the wealthiest of Americans, uh, making sure that unions get their fair share when it comes to contract negotiations. I don't think his message has to change. I think he has to keep on with the same message that he's had. I actually disagree. Um, I think that his message is actually very dangerous. And I think what dangerous? I think it's dangerous. And I think essentially what de Blasio was saying is he's instituting a class warfare. And I think Joe oh, spoke specifically oh. to that when he said, listen, I'm not the mayor that's going to divide you. I'm the mayor that's going to unite you. And I think that's when what's you, important when, you're when talking, talking about When you're talking executive. about a majority of New York City uh, citizens, who don't have, who are not, uh, who are at the poverty line, to say that we have a class warfare because you talk about taxing the wealthiest Disagree. of Americans in New York, I think that's divisive. I, I think if this is no. how this campaign is going to go, where Joe Loder is going to attack Bill de Blasio for leading to people who no. are average New Yorkers, that's not a smart this, strategy. This, ra this mayoral race is going to talk about actually who's qualified to do the job. They're all qualified who's qualified to, to handle 8.5 million, million, million New Yorkers and actually look at the fact that, listen, de Blasio has never had an executive position, yet this man is pushed and I think that's look. a dangerous thing to put someone in control of a budget that uh, large. All right, Joe Loda, use that message and you lose. Look, th but the I bottom think, line I think is, it's the reality of what we're looking at. No, it's your reality. No, it's, it's the it, reality it, of every New no, Yorker in New York you're City. You're contriving your own vision of reality no. and thinking that that's no. how most Americans in New York City think and that's not the well, case. We're not talking about most Americans, we're talking about New Yorkers here and we're talking about the fact that e right even now, better, to the only my qualified point. candidate the, in this race, when you took it, true executive experience is Joe Loda and I think the advantage that Bill Thompson has is because he's the former controller and because he understands the budget well, in New let York. Me, that's let, me, let me break it here, throw a name in that we haven't, heard, that we, that we haven't <laughs> mentioned at all. And sure. of course, obviously, by now, done deal, but Christine Quinn. Oh. <laughs> High expectations, and uh, unfortunately, I think that uh, she couldn't deliver. And I think the sad part is, instead of uh, running as maybe the, the first openly gay candidate, uh, she probably should have looked at historically running as probably the first female candidate, being the only female in the race. Well, I think she had bigger issues than her gender or her sexual orientation. I, I mean, her problem is she peaked way too early, uh, and she came out as a front runner, and everyone started piling on her. And then anybody, anybody but Quinn came in there and started piling on her again. Uh, her issue is that she was too closely aligned with the Bloomberg administration. She wanted mm -hmm. to keep many of the same policies, extend them even further, uh, keep Ray Kelly on the job, who's the chief architect of Stop and Frisk. You can't say things like that to a liberal a city like New York. Uh, and so her problems w were more aligned with her policies. And I don't think people really, at least from my experience, disagreed with her or disliked her because of who she is as a person, but more of what she stood for. Mm -hmm. When you look at the fact that she did peak early, mm -hmm. and a lot of yeah. people were saying, listen, you know what, this could be the, the, the next mayor. Right. Uh, where did her downfall go? Because some people said the fact that she didn't show up to certain debates. I, you know, I actually agree with that. I think uh, you know, she played it too safe. And unfortunately, you know, uh, 
you know, Bloomberg's third term, I think, really kind of destroyed it for her. I think that close alliance or even the perception of that close mm -hmm. alliance really kind of killed their chances. Uh, and I think it was a trust factor with most New Yorkers. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a quick break. But coming up after the break, we're going to continue our discussion on the New York City uh, uh, political results of the, Demo of the, I should say, the primary results from yesterday. Also, we will bring up former New York Governor Elliot Spitzer. That conversation coming up right after this. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ruben Diaz Jr. I'm not just the Bronx Borough President, but I'm a father and an uncle. I can't emphasize enough how important it is for men and fathers to be a part of their children's lives. Let me talk to you about a program that's come out of my office, the Bronx Fathers Taking Action Committee, which is a committee of Bronx fathers and men formed to help uplift the institution of fatherhood while responsibly respecting the privilege of being a dad. Our mission statement is to engage, empower, educate, and encourage fathers, grandfathers, and uncles of all ages by providing them with the resources and help that they need in order to build new relationships with the leaders in our community. Ultimately, this initiative will help reinforce Bronx men as positive role models. So, I just want to take the time out to encourage fathers, grandfathers, uncles, men of all corners of the Bronx to take an important role in the lives of the children in your family and in our community, and also to get involved in this uplifting committee. Good job, Theo. Thank Let's you. Let's start it again, Theo. All right. A single ember from a wildfire can travel over a mile. That ember can ignite and destroy your home or community. You can't control where that ember will land. Only what happens before it does. Visit fireadapted.org to learn how you can help protect your community from wildfires. A single ember that escapes from a wildfire can travel more than a mile. You can't control where that ember will land, only what happens when it does. Get Fire Adapted now at fireadapted.org. Hello, I'm Carla Cadenas, and you can check out Open 2.0 at 4.30 on Fridays or on the web at www.bronxnet.org. And welcome back as we continue our discussion on the 2013 primary elections with Democratic strategist Roy Paul, Republican strategist Brandon Bryce. And uh, when we were leaving our conversation uh, before the break, we were talking a little bit more about Christine Quinn. Roy, I know you want to add something in there. Yeah. Well, when I ran for office, um, I had a quasi-campaign manager who had no business managing my campaign, but that was besides the point. He said something to me that <laughs> stuck. He said, remember that anything can happen. And Christine Quinn didn't think that anything could happen. She thought that she was going to win. Uh, I moderated two community forums for the Democrats who were running for mayor, and she didn't show up to either one of them. And that was consistent throughout the entire city. She consistently buffed on forums that she should have been at, where there are primary voters who are consistently coming out over and over again. These are union voters, and she completely buffed them, and people were really upset with that. I actually agree. I think, uh, you know, unfortunately she didn't show up. And uh, a big part of this game is name recognition. I think, uh, unlike Christine Quinn, de Blasio actually connected with voters. He showed up. Uh, and a matter of fact, I even attended a few of these events, and he was there every single time. And so and, I think that plays a factor. And to add to that, after the first forum that I did with de Blasio, uh, he came up to me, shook my hand, said, you did a great job. And then he emailed me after the forum. And I said, well, I'll be. Well. And that's when I said, you know what? If this guy keeps doing that all across the city, he's going to get elected. <laughs> so we did the second forum with him at your college. Anthony Wien was in this race at that time. And he came up to me before the forum and he said, we're going to do a better job than the first time, right? And I said, we're going to do my best. And then after that, we had a texting conversation. I'm sitting there with Bill de Blasio. I'm going, this is 
This is mm -hmm. surreal, you know, right? But this is, he has mastered the art of what Terry Williams calls the art of the personal touch. Mm -hmm. And he will shake your hand, he will take a photograph with you, and, you know, if you get that close to him, he'll give you his email or his phone number, and you can chat it up with Bill de Blasio. And that's, and that's something that I think in this day and age it seems <coughs> to be working, which is like yeah. on, the, on, the, on the grassroots yeah. level. We're here in the borough of the Bronx, so we have to ask a question right. about uh, former Bronx Borough President Adolfo Carrion. Many people had expected... Uh, well, they really weren't sure what to expect, yeah. I guess, but, but your, your take. It, it's interesting. Uh, you know, Adolfo, now that he's running on the independent side, um, I mean, it, it's going to be a challenge. You know, I think Adolfo, many people had high hopes. Uh, many people consider he was going to be the first Hispanic mayor of New York City. Um, I think coming out of the Obama administration, he had a leg up. Uh, but I think it's going to be a challenge getting support from the independent side. And I think... Uh, you know, unfortunately, I don't really see it happening. Well, saying he has a challenge is an understatement. He's got no chance of winning. Uh, let's just be honest with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the hype is created mostly by us. I mean, we, we sit here and we speculate, and that speculation causes hype because then people watch it on TV, and they're like, yeah, Adolfo, carry on, first half. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at his positions, it's just not in line with either party. The fact that he had to switch from the Democratic Party in the beginning uh, shows that he had a lot of uh, Which trouble is where I was getting going, the nomination. Did, right. he, yeah. did he probably shoot himself in one foot and or both by this consistent switch? Well, so, yeah. you, you know, you know I, I think it was an issue of dealing with uh, the Democratic machine. I know there was even talks of uh, possibly him being a conservative looking at the Republican ticket. And it's, what's interesting, I think, uh, aside from Loda and aside even with the earlier talks of Ray Kelly running, he would have actually been an interesting candidate if the Republicans had backed him early on. Well, he so. was, uh, there was pressure applied to him because Bill mm -hmm. Thompson knew that his only path to making it in this race was through the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And if Adolfo Carrion ran and got a lot of support on the Democratic side there, then Bill Thompson knew he had no shot. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think you saw a big push from the Bronx Democratic machine, which did, in fact, go to Bill Thompson. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of people, probably like Ruben Diaz Jr., who now supports Thompson, who probably said to Carrion, you have to step out of this one. Go, ahead, go a little mm -hmm. bit further into uh, yesterday today's results, many people were looking at former New York Governor Elliot Spitzer, uh -huh. trying to see what was going to transpire if he had a chance. Of course, we know uh, close, but no cigar. Spitzer, uh, you know, sad to say, he unfortunately he tanked, and I think it came back to integrity. Uh, Spitzer, I mean, this is the sheriff of Wall Street. This guy actually understands finance probably better than any candidate in New York City, but unfortunately it goes back to integrity. And even if you look at Scott Stringer's ads, it really didn't really talk about qualifications. It talked about integrity. And I think the fact that New Yorkers aren't stupid, even with Anthony Weiner, who I believe came in at 4%, uh, there was still this whole thing that, hey, you know, integrity actually means something in politics. And people liked Spitzer. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's the same with the poll with Bloomberg. People liked this policy, some of them at least, but then said we need a change. Mm -hmm. And I think with Spitzer, there was, uh, there was a lady I was on the bus with her, uh, and, she's, and I talked to her about Spitzer, and she goes, oh, yeah, I liked him. And so she had a very positive reaction when I said his name, and then she stopped and said, wait a second, didn't he hire prostitutes? <laughs> <laughs> and so I think there was all this hype about, wait a second, oh yeah, I liked him, he was a great guy. And then, wait a second, but didn't he hire? So it goes back to what he did, and unfortunately, that's going to stick with him forever. And the same with Anthony Weiner. I mean, people like his fight. You know, he gets on the congressional floor, and he starts yelling at people, he points his finger, and people are like, yeah, New York is like that fire in the belly. And then they go, wait a second, isn't his Weiner on the internet? You know, I don't know, I don't know about, uh, about loins being on the internet. <laughs> But what, well, I, but what, been, but what I will say, but what I will say is, is, is one of the things that we've seen is uh, the, the primaries last night was nothing but a, a case of the tortoise and the hare. We look at Scott Stringer, who played it very cool throughout the year. Even de Blasio, who stayed, two in, uh, who stayed second and third in the races, shot to the top last night. And so I think it's going to be a very interesting race in the next three weeks out on the Democrat side. Oh, absolutely. Again, anything can happen. If you look yep. at all of these races, everyone was presumed to be out in the front. The public advocates race, so Letitia James coming out of nowhere. Whoa, who would have thought? Mm -hmm. She is on track to being the first African-American woman elected citywide. That's huge. And no one thought she could do it. Everyone thought that Daniel Squadron was going to pull it away. Manhattan Borough President's race. Everyone thought mm -hmm. Julie Menning came out strong in the bidding. She had all the money. She had all the endorsements. And Gail Brewer, wow, came out of nowhere and, and just uh, socked everyone out. So anything can happen. And the moment we lose track of that and think that we're going to win just because of money or name recognition or endorsement you lose. Mm -hmm. Of all the races yesterday, which ones uh, surprised you most? I, I would say, I, was, I, I, would, I would probably say the mayor's race. And the reason being is because I think many people thought de Blasio had it nipped in the butt. Um, and out of all people, to have Bill Thompson uh, even come remotely close to that and even possibly consider a runoff, I think a lot of New Yorkers were shocked. And I think not only is it a game changer, but like I said, 
today is a whole new day. Today is a whole new election. And those three weeks could be, cr could be critical for Bill de Blasio. I was actually looking at a city council race in Brooklyn, uh, a former assemblyman, Vito Lopez, mm -hmm. uh, who ran and was uh, faced by uh, a new challenger, Antonio Reynoso, who was chief of staff to Diana. Uh, and I had a sneaking suspicion that he could win. But I was still not ready to bet any money on that race. I <laughs> thought that there was a good chance that Vito Lopez would keep the seat. I was also very surprised, um, although I didn't follow it very closely, the Brooklyn DA's race, uh, you know, Charles Hines mm -hmm. being unseated uh, after decades of office by Ken Thompson. Absolutely. I was surprised at that one, too. Right. I think that's pretty surprising, too. We're also looking at District 8, Melissa Margarito uh, coming away and winning. Some people thought that she might have a strong opposition there. She still comes away with the seat. Any, any thoughts there? No. I, the same way that yeah. people thought thought Inez Dickens had a strong challenge with Vince Morgan and she came away with 70% of the vote. I think when you have an incumbent, unless, you know, they are convicted of a crime or they uh, had some kind of impropriety behavior, I don't think it's very easy to unseat a, a, an incumbent. You have to go through great lengths to, to be able to do that mm -hmm. because they're in a position of, of power in their seat. They can allocate money, uh, lots of money to different community programs, and people are usually loyal to that. Even people who may not support an incumbent will vote for them because they got money because of a particular program. No, I actually agree. I, you know, I think even looking at the races between Vince Morgan and Inez Dickens and even Mark Levine and uh, Joyce Johnson, you know, these are all races where people have been active in their community. Um, and I think that, you know, people tend to go with what they know. Vanessa Gibson moving from the yeah. assembly to the exactly. city council. Mm -hmm. Very excited because um, Vanessa Gibson is one of those young uh, legislators who believes in young people being involved in the process. And she's all about community. Um, mm -hmm. uh, when she was serving uh, as chief of staff to uh, Aurelia Green, I, I remember meeting with her and she was always about, you know, everyone in this room, she was talking to a group of young Democrats, everybody needs to challenge the status quo. Everybody needs to get involved and you can do it. And so to see her ascend in this way, and let's face it, nobody wants to be in Albany right now. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a mess up there. And uh, mm -hmm. for her to get out of there, I'd rather not have someone who's as good as she is be associated with that. Really? You know, actually, he brought up a very interesting point about the youth vote. Um, I think the first time we really saw this was even in the presidential election, where that's a third tier. Most people are always focused on the business community. They focus mm -hmm. on seniors. But the fact that youth are getting involved now, I think that's a very interesting race. And I think it's going to be a very interesting race for years to come. Do, we see, do we see a greater turnout in November? For young people? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, if, and that's mm -hmm. indicative of who are working on these campaigns. If you go uh, out there in the volunteer corps, these, the, the young people are the ones who are volunteering. I mean, yes, you do have a core base of mm -hmm. you know, people connected to the party who are getting involved, but the young people are the, the schedulers. The young people are the body people. The young people are the ones even leading the campaigns. Uh, they're being consultants on the campaigns. Bill Thompson has hired a lot of my friends who are consultants now making decent money uh, because they've gotten involved in the political process very early. So, and a a lot of the city council members, the new ones, are young people. Costa Constantinides and Astoria Queens. A friend of mine who I used to go out and have a beer with is now on the city council. Uh, and so there, there are a lot of young people moving into these positions of power and they're running for office, not just getting involved, but running. But, you know, in addition to not only young people getting involved, I think the rate of social media and technology is huge. Uh, we look at Bill Thompson has invested a lot in it. Bill de Blasio has invested a lot in social media and really pumping out his message. And I think that's what's going to play. That's, what, that's what's going to be more important when you talk about youth getting involved is the rate of social media, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, getting involved in campaign. And the selfies. It's no longer about, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, what you're doing in terms of a policy position. But if you see Bill de Blasio and his son with his afro, that gets a thousand likes. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll talk, All right. we'll talk more about that in the time to come. Roy Powell, Brandon Bryce, thank you so much for being with, with us you. on Open. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? We do have to take a quick break, but when we return, we're going to find out how one organization is working to bring opportunity to you. So stay tuned because that's coming up right after this. Hi, this is Jeff Fox for 107.5 WBLS. And when I get off the radio, I check out my man, the Dr. Bob Lee and Cool Clyde. It's open on BronxNet. I never miss it. Long before I was in Hollywood, I had a grandmother by the name of Estelle Marie Tavern, positive role model to make sure that I was on a straight path. Big Brothers Big Sisters carefully screens volunteers and places them in long-term mentoring matches with kids who face adversity. With more volunteers, especially men, and more donations, every little who needs a big can have it. Start something. If it's been a while since you've been involved, start something again. Learn more at BigBrothersBigSisters.org. This was me, and mom and dad, and my big brother Alex, 
Man Jack. This was the day that I learned that sandals get their name from sand, and that the ocean is bigger than all of us. This was the day we all got to forget that I was sick. This was my wish. Know what? What? Since I got adopted, I've learned a lot about these humans. Uh, I know. I mean, check out these two. It's Flirt City over here. Yeah, I noticed that. It looks like my human is definitely into your human. Oh, look! I think she's getting his number. Nice. Your human's got some sweet moves. Takes after his dog. <laughs> oh, look, they're doing that thing where they put their arms around each other. She kicked up a leg. It's like in the movies. That's awesome. Looks like we're going to be hanging out a little bit more. I grew up in the housing projects of Cleveland. I didn't even know that life could be any better than it was. Education for me has been a way to get away from the agony of what was normal life. I want to be able to impact the community, not just look back on where I came from, but to reach back to where I came from and pull some people up with me. My name is David, and I am your dividend. The Riverdale Children's Theater brings teens of all backgrounds together to learn about themselves, each other, and performing. And in the coming weeks, they're going to be hosting auditions for the show Les Miserables. And we welcome now the artistic director, Becky Lily Woods, who is here with us. And good to have you, Becky. Thank you, Darren. Thank you so much. So it's got to be an exciting time for you as you are attempting to engage these young people to be a part of a powerful and um, a very long-standing Broadway show. Oh, it's so exciting. Um, Les Mis has always been one of my favorite shows, and uh, we are so excited to be bringing it to the Lovinger Theater in February. Um, and we so appreciate being here because we really want to get the word out to teens all over the Bronx mm -hmm. um, to come out and audition for us. So you're going to have these auditions. They're going to be open up to Bronx teens from all across the borough? All across the borough. You know, our, our location, our rehearsal location is in Riverdale. You know, right now we do have teens coming from many different parts of the Bronx as well as the city and, uh, and Westchester. But we feel like we could really reach out to more teens in the Bronx. Um, and so we really want to get the word out to them um, about this great opportunity. You know, one of my dreams is really to have a Bronx youth theater where we have teens from all over the Bronx, you know, performing at the Lovinger Theater at Lehman College. And um, so we feel like with Les Mis School Edition, this could be a great opportunity to, to bring more kids together. So kids will have the opportunity, the school edition is between 8th and 12th grade? Yes. Um, one of the, this special school edition is the entire show, but it is cut down so that it's only two hours instead of three hours. Um, and some of the keys are changed a bit just so that they fit better in youth voices. But it is the whole show, and it's an amazing show. I've seen it done. Um, and the requirement is that all the children or youth in the show need to be 19 or under and a full-time high school student. Mm. So even if you're 20 years old and in college, you can't be in it. Oh, okay. So <laughs> yeah, Darren, sorry. 19 and under. Yeah, 19 and under. That, that takes me um, out of the mix. And so we're doing it for teens 8th through 12th grade. Okay, and so the show will premiere in February? Yes. Um, and as well, we actually have a lot of opportunities for some other kids. Um, mm -hmm. We are also having auditions for our younger group, Second Beauty and the Beast, okay. which is also going to be at the Lovinger. And we're seeing some clips right now, and uh, this is, I believe, Les, Les Mis. And uh, talking about Les Mis, why Les Mis? Well, you know, with the, with the movie coming out this year, it's, it's, everybody's so passionate about it. It's such a beautiful score, one of the best. Mm -hmm. um, and the movie's really brought back the popularity of the show, um, so much that they're reopening the show on Broadway in March. Um, and as I was discussing with our executive director, Derek, Derek Woods, this will be our last chance to do it. Once the show's on Broadway, you, you can't get the rights to it. So mm. I really wanted to do this for our teens that we're working with right now and for all the teens of the Bronx because there's a good chance uh, kids aren't going to get a chance to do this show again for another seven or eight years. Because once it hits Broadway, yeah. that's it. Yeah, we won't be able to do it. Yeah. Uh, so so we're, we're actually one of the very last groups to do it. The show opens, premieres, um, previews on Broadway in March. Mm. So February. So if you're a student out there and you really want to take part in this and this is your opportunity to really make an have an audition, uh, there are two auditions available. Let's give them the audition yes. dates. Um, uh, we are having auditions this Sunday um, from 5 to 7. That's at the Riverdale Jewish Center in Riverdale. All of the address and everything is on our website. Mm -hmm. And then we're also having auditions Tuesday evening from 5 to 7 as well. We really are looking for, you know, 
kids that are passionate about this want to do it. You know, all levels of experience are welcome. You know, we are especially reaching out to teen boys. You know, we need a lot of students up there on the barricade. So, you know, we really hope that um, kids will come out to, to take a part of this. Another exciting thing that we're doing is we are going to have um, workshops with some Broadway performers who were mm -hmm. in the show. One of the gentlemen who played Javert on Broadway is going to be coming to work with the kids. So it's just a, a really great opportunity. So an opportunity to learn firsthand and get firsthand experience from somebody who's actually been there, yeah. done that, and got a t-shirt. <laughs> it's really exciting. <laughs> well, when, you give, when, when you think about kids right now being involved in the arts and looking at the arts nowadays, it's one of the things that immediately gets cut from school budgets and things like that. Give me your thoughts about, yeah. you know how we've just you know come so far but yet and still when it comes to the arts it's almost like the yeah. first thing that gets cut it, it really has and I have to say that um you know when I was growing up it was a big part of what I did mm -hmm. that's where I got my confidence that's where I developed my friendships it was a huge part of my upbringing um, and one thing I have noticed is you know about New York City if you go out to Minnesota, they have full-time music teacher, they have a full-time drama teacher, they have a full-time musical theater teacher. They, but here in New York, we, we are cutting that. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to the kids. They learn so much. They learn so much confidence. And it's, it's just one of the amazing things um, that I think is really missing from, from a lot of public education. So we want to we wanna bring that to people. And, you know, mentioning that, we, it is a tuition-based um, program, Darren, but we, one of our mottos is we aren't going to turn away anybody who wants mm -hmm. to take a part of this. We do have scholarships, and so that shouldn't stop anyone from coming to auditioning because, w you know, we're really passionate about that, bringing this to the kids. And part of the Riverdale Children's Theater, let's give a people a little bit more information about the Riverdale Children's Theater because in addition to Les Mis, you got some other things going yeah, on. Yeah, we, we do. We, um, we're starting our, our winter season, and this is our fourth year. And um, we are going to be doing Beauty and the Beast. That's going to be from second to eighth graders. Um, it'll probably be a cast of about 60 kids. Last year we did Peter Pan, mm -hmm. which was absolutely amazing. And we do it at the beautiful Lovinger Theater, 500 seat state of the art theater. Um, Beauty and the Beast will be also accompanied by the Celia Cruz High School Orchestra. So exciting. And so that's for second through eighth graders. So we want to encourage those kids to come as well. And then we also, of course, are doing. Um, Les Mis for our high school students. Um, a couple of other great things that we do, we do a free high school audition prep um, seminar for all Bronx high school students, or actually eighth grade students, who mm -hmm. are trying to get into the specialized high schools, like LaGuardia, Performing Arts High Schools, and um, we do that right here at Lehman College as well. So, you know, there's a lot of great things we offer, um, and, w you know, one of our um, of uh, the other things that's so important to us is, is bringing all different cultures together. In Riverdale, um, we have a very large um, Jewish culture. Um, in other parts of the Bronx, um, you know, they don't, they don't all interact together. So one of the great things about our group is we're bringing kids from all different cultures together, and it's great. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're working together. They're getting to know each other. It's a, it's a great experience. And we want to tell you that, once again, if you really have a desire to be a part of Les Mis, uh, you have the opportunity starting this weekend. And so uh, let's give them the date and time again. Yeah. Um, so... The, the auditions are this Sunday at the Riverdale Jewish Center, 3700 Independence Avenue. That's in Riverdale. 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock will be seeing Kids for Les Mis. They need to come with a song. We'd love it if they had a CD accompaniment, but if they don't, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, so they come with a song to sing for us. Um, and then we're also having auditions on Tuesday, the 17th from 5 to 7. Um, and if they have any questions, um, our number is on the website. Um, so they can give us a call. Our website is www.riverdaletheater.org. Um, they can send me an email. I'm Becky at riverdaletheater.org, and we'd love to hear from them if any parents have any more questions or any kids want to find out what would be a good audition song. And for somebody, you know, we know about Les Mis, but for somebody out there who might be watching, ah, I don't know about it. And because uh, for us, we're like, wow, we know it, right? Well, but one of the most amazing um, pop scores, it's virtually a pop opera. It's, the show is in, entirely sung. Um, and the music is just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and it's the story of Jean Valjean, um, uh, a prisoner in, um, in France, and his story of redemption. We meet Fantine along the way, who's um, taking care of her young daughter, and it's, the, it's, it's, it's part espionage, you know, Javert searching for Jean Valjean throughout the whole play, um, but a real story of redemption, and um, 
just an absolutely beautiful story, and I, I think the kids will love it. So once you get these kids under one banner and you start working with them, how long is it going to take you to really prep them and be ready? Well, we start rehearsals in October. Um, we have two rehearsals a week, so it's not a huge time commitment because I know a lot of kids are worried about their school. But we rehearse two hours um, one day a week, and then we rehearse on Sundays um, starting in October, and the show will open in February. So we do have about three months of rehearsals. They get, they get more intense towards the end when we start building the sets. We have you know, full sets, full lights, um, and we start adding the costumes. But that's when it gets a little bit um, more time, time intensive. Mm -hmm. We'll be seeing them for those two weeks right before the show. Um, and so it, right now it's just about twice a week for, three, for about three months, yeah. Let's assume somebody's on the fence, watching at home, they're <laughs> saying, I'm on the fence, I don't know I want to do this, da, 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 da. Yeah, and I might not have the necessary experience to be able well, to do You know do what, they should just come. Come and see what it's like. Come to the audition. Meet us. Um, you know, we'll, we'll take the time to talk to them. They'll have more information at the audition. And we always do have callbacks where we bring the kids back in. Mm -hmm. They'll work together as a group, and they can make their mind up about whether it's something they want to be involved in. But I, I know it's going to be a, an amazing experience for any youth that would like to be a part of it. Well, Becky, best wishes, and hopefully we will see the kids out there this uh, Sunday and then next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank uh, you so much, Darren. All righty, Ms. Becky Lily Woods, who is here with us, and uh, we want to thank her for coming and sharing more information about the Riverdale Children's Theater. What you can do is go to www.riverdaletheater.org. You can find out more information about that, and be sure to get out there to get to those auditions. Once again, the first one taking place the 15th from 3 to 5, and the second one Tuesday the 17th from 5 to 7. And unfortunately, we are going to have to shut down because that's all we have for Open for Today's show. It's definitely been a pleasure coming to your homes. We, of course, want to thank our guests for joining us and most of all, you, the viewer, for tuning in. Now, if you missed any part of today's show, guess what? Go back 10 o'clock p.m., catch the Recable cast on Cablevision's Channel 67, Verizon Files Channel 33, or you can watch anytime on the web at www.bronxnet.org. We encourage you to have a great week. Most of all, don't forget to keep your heart, your mind, and this channel wide open. Take care. NFC, AFC, offensive linemen, defensive tackles, quarterbacks, and cornerbacks are all working with United Way for a million little reasons, the kids of our communities, to ensure their academic success all the way to graduation day. You see, it takes about 12 years to create a graduate, but it takes the same time to create a dropout. And the difference between a kid becoming one or the other could be a professional athlete or it could be you. Studies showed the earlier we get to kids, the better their chances. So become a United Way volunteer reader, tutor, or mentor, and make a difference in the life of a child, for the life of that child. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Join your favorite NFL players. Take the pledge. Go to unitedway.org. So, I got this new family. And I don't know what it is about this one, but she can't seem to put down that toy. Oh, and she even talks to it. Who should talk?